All right, all right. Thank you very much for having us. What I, what I love about Web Summit is the intimacy. It's just 20,000 of our nearest and dearest friends. <laughs> um, OK, let's get into this. We're here to talk about what makes a really good pitch. And uh, I'm going to start with you, Fred, because you almost certainly heard many more pitches than maybe anyone in this room. Very briefly, what, what makes a good pitch? Uh, so you just heard Gary say, nobody gives a fuck or a shit. I forget. <laughs> um, maybe both. I think the first thing you need to do, you have 15 minutes at the beginning to grab the attention and to raise the pulse and to make your audience or your VCs care. And I think if you don't excite me, scare me, grab me in the first 15 minutes, you're probably unlikely to sort of raise my level of attention after that. And then it's all about building credibility and trust and sort of getting to the point where I feel like I want to write you a check. But I think the primary thing about the pitch is just you know, doing something that's big enough, interesting enough, important enough, and with enough intensity that I'm leaning forward and I'm wanting to back you. Okay. Why do you want to be scared by a founder, though? Um, You're so giving these people money. Why do you want them to frighten you? I, I honestly like founders with a bit of an edge. And I want people where I'm thinking, whoa, I'm not sure I want to bet against that guy or that lady because they scare me a little. Um, and most of the people I've backed, like Will Shue at Deliveroo or Alex Chesterman at Zoopla, they have that edge. And you know, there are people you just do not want to be in competition against. Payal, does this sound familiar? Absolutely. I think one of the most important things is have a story. Without a story, people aren't going to connect to what you're telling, what you have a pain point about. And it's so important for them to know why you've created the company. Without that connection to the broader vision that you have, why are you going to do it? Why are you going to accomplish? Literally a story, to? though, like a really good narrative? Yeah. I mean, look, you can have slides. One of my favorite investors that I met, I literally sat down, and he goes, don't show me slides. Just tell me what you're building. Give me the high-level metrics. And I spoke from my heart. I told him the story of my company, and it was the most magnificent investor ended up becoming my Series A investor because it was a genuine, authentic story that I told him. OK. Sarah, this thing about passion, this, this keeps coming up. It sounds kind of like, you know, corporate. It's a corporate buzzword. Is it real? Without a I mean, doubt. Some companies are just solving problems, aren't they? Well, look, I think it's absolutely important to identify a real pain point and a solution that you can bring to the market. Make sure that it's a big market that you're going after. That always helps and why you're going to win. But I, I think one of the things that happens is People are trying to understand, do I want to bet on you? Do I want to bet on the team? And I think that that's where the passion comes in. Because the reality is, in a lot of cases, and I'm, I'm sure that there's some examples here, is that an investor sometimes will bet on a team and an idea. But the idea ends up changing, and they are still invested in the team. And they need to feel like, is this team going to be able to manage the ups and downs, twists and turns? If it doesn't work out, are they going to have the stick to to pivot into something else? And I think you could go through almost every major win in terms of companies, and there has been a major turning point where betting on the team and its passion has led the investor to be in a situation where They've come out the other end with a great yeah. outcome. Is, there, is this true, Fred? Do, people, do you buy the management, not the model? So people who invest in models over teams are dumb. Um, you know, there are people that Tweet say, that. great market, great market, B team, I'll work on the team. It's idiotic, because we know that the story is prose. Um, I absolutely think, by the way, the narrative is core. If you look at TJ Parker at Pellpack, if TJ had come into my office and said, I'm building an online pharmacy, it would have been a short conversation. But he comes in and he says, I'm helping people with complex conditions live better. I'm giving them back their lives because they don't have to do pillboxes. I'm making sure they medicate properly. And I'm all about life. I'm all about enjoying life. I'm all about my mission is to help people live better lives through better pharmacy. And you know, that to me is a narrative that I can relate to because I'm thinking I can hire people against that narrative. I can build partnerships against that narrative. I can market against that narrative. And it's imbued with a sense of purpose. And sense of purpose is what carries you through the dark days. Because every company has dark days when you think all is lost. If you're not freaking passionate about what you're building, 
you will die through these times. Okay. So not buying the correct management is a VC mistake. In terms of pitching, what mistakes, Pyle, what mistakes have you seen companies make or what mistakes have you seen in pitch decks? Yeah, I think um, usually when I see entrepreneurs, they tend to you know, talk about the market and the industry, which is obviously very important, but the most important thing is your product. What are you selling and does it really have product market fit? And if you can convince me... Are VCs me, like specifically asking you that in the pitch? What is the product market fit? You have to have a good answer for that? You need to be able to show through metrics that something is working, right? Because that's ultimately, you know, once again, this depends on stage. I think early on it goes back to having the story and they're investing in you. But once you actually are starting to make progress, they want to make sure that they're seeing you and the metrics that are making progress. Um, one of my favorite articles I read told me, you know, people invest in lines, not dots. So through your story, what does that mean? <laughs> you need to keep having data points of progress, right? So even if an investor, and we've all had investors say no to us, there are times where you go back and you keep them in the loop and you keep telling them the progress and the perseverance you have. And so the story even sometimes comes through those through those dots that eventually form a story for investors if you don't necessarily get them on the first try. And I think that that story is once again connected to the heart of all of this. Sarah, does this ring true with you? So I think one of the most common mistakes is something that you'll hear Reid Hoffman talk about. And that is there are times when you're out and you're doing a financing strategy and it's usually early on and you're talking about the market you're going after, the idea that you have, really the vision of the company. And then there are times when you're out using the information around revenue progress that you have. And I think sometimes early young companies start talking about a little bit of revenue and they start conflating those two scenarios. Am I ready to invest in this company as an investor based on the vision or is it, this is a company that has traction and much more predictable revenue? And I, that may sound strange that you, early on, sh maybe should not be talking about revenue, but rather talking about, there's revenue potential, but we haven't started our revenue efforts or we're still testing, but let's not make that the focus of the thesis of the investment. And I think sometimes early or young entrepreneurs conflate those two things and then you end up with a confusing message. And when there's confusion in an investment, it usually doesn't happen. My, my favorite mistake is um, I play little tricks on people, right? So I'll open a very, I'll, I'll ask a very wide question about your industry. And then half the time, the entrepreneur goes 15 minutes into a global answer to the question. And I'm sitting there thinking, wow, we have 45 minutes together. And you're now gone into a wild tangent on talking about the market. And actually, you're not managing to the outcome you want, which is to get the next meeting or to get that check. And so we play little tricks like that to see whether the person's like in control and understand what they're trying to achieve or whether they get like thrown off track really fast. Because to me, that's an indication of like awareness, um, self-confidence, et cetera, that they know that, hey, in 45 minutes, I got to get this guy to lean forward and take the next meeting or write me a check, right? I, I'm interested that you're quite focused on like the awareness and the performance of the pitch as if it's a piece of theater. This is, there's money at stake here on a real thing. Why are you interested in the theater? Well, I, so I think that we watch a person in a situation of stress and just see how they perform against the objective they should have in their mind, which is to get us engaged. And so for me, it's a proxy as to whether they can sign a large partnership, they can sell their company in M&A, they can hire a tough guy. You know, all these are indicators of how someone performs. And I think environmental awareness and EQ in a CEO is massively important because the role of the CEO at the end of the day is going to be define the vision, you know, repeat the vision a million times, make sure people are aligned with the vision, and then find a way to move the ball down the field every day. And these soft qualities end up being absolutely paramount to how companies perform. Okay. It, it's interesting. Uh, before I uh, was an entrepreneur, I worked at Greylock as an associate. And, and so I got to hear the other side of how a partnership talked about an investment. And I was blown away with the amount of time that the partners would talk about the people, about how they approached the situation, and also the dynamic between the management team. 
How did that work out? Ooh, it looks like these two people aren't getting along and how's that gonna resolve itself? I was just blown away, especially with early stage companies, that it was a lot more about the people. And to your point, how do they handle the stress? What's gonna happen with the conflict? Do we think that this CEO is going to be able to scale? If we went to them and said, we need to replace you, how would they handle it? That almost dominated more than 50% of the conversation, not about how big is the market and what's the revenue potential per se. More than 50% of the conversation. I would say, you know, most people focus on selling like their slides when they're putting together the market deck and what they're going to do in the pitch. Yeah, before you have to we learn, started this panel, I thought the deck was the important thing. You Apparently have to learn not. to sell yourself. <laughs> you know, I think people forget that they need to look at where else they've maybe performed in their life or really been in a place where they were confident. And whatever that energy point is for you, you need to recreate in that meeting. And sometimes, look, the meeting might be in an elevator. You have two minutes with somebody. Sometimes it might be a 45-minute meeting, and you need to be able to shift your message, shift your outcome, and what by what you say, by authentically being there and just being able to say what's important to you. I think slides are a crutch. <laughs> and half the time, if you close your slide deck and you focus on yeah. being really present and aware of the person who's in front of you, you will do a much better job. Completely and agree. If people want slides, you should be able to provide it to them because you want to be professional. But focus on, you know, I invest in people when I, quote unquote, fall in love with them. It's literally an emotional act of saying, I want to be in business with that person. That's what you're trying to achieve. The rest is all mechanics. Is your market big enough, blah, blah, blah. You know, we'll do the diligence, we're rigorous, but it's really around faith. You right. know, it's an act of faith, and that's what you're trying to elicit. And it goes back to the point of telling a story. When you're telling a genuine story to anyone, you don't need slides. If it's a real story, you really rely on the message, not on slides to carry you through. And that being said, I do think that there's value in going through the exercise of building the slides, but you shouldn't need the slides to tell the story. It just helps you organize your, thought your thoughts and have an, a crisp narrative. Or, or put it a different way. If you don't own your material 100%, you won't be able to relax into the interaction and understand how to deal with interruptions, see whether <laughs> someone in the audience is you know, uh, zooming out. And so you want to be... Checking their phone, right. so a favorite thing the VCs <laughs> like to do. Exactly. So you want to be absolutely on top of your metrics. We don't like people who don't own their metrics because ultimately you're building a business. So you want those like, there must be like a reflex. So then you can really focus on the interaction. So that's the reason why you need great materials and you need to own them. But it's so because you can almost free yourself of the material and be, and be present. Mm -hmm. Have you lost the pitch if a VC starts checking his or her phone in the meeting? Is that the kiss of yes, death? Yes, absolutely. That's the kiss of death, okay. <laughs> you know, what, one thing that we haven't talked about, you can talk a lot about the pitch and what you're bringing to the table, but I, I do think it's a, it's a two-way interview, which is you're interviewing whether or not you want this person to be on your board and to be a part of your team. In many cases, you're, you're interviewing someone to be your boss. And so I, if the pitch is going well, if they're engaged and they're excited, I think that there's an opportunity to ask some of the questions about what that person, the potential investor, can bring to the table. And hopefully, you've done your research to know you've invested in these three companies. This is part of the reason why we think there's a good match with having you invest in our company and because being on be, the board. There will be bad times, right? And you need these people to support you through the bad times and not abandon you and write you off as... So I always make sure that, I, that we have a disagreement before investing. <laughs> and the reason is that I want to know whether our conflict resolution mechanism is healthy. Because there are times when we won't, I'm here because I want to help you build a great business. Hopefully, we can be friends. I'm great friends with TJ Parker. I'm also the guy who pushes him the most. Why? Because I care. I care that he builds a great company, which means I want to know that when tough times come, we have a way. It's like a couple, right? We have a way of conflict resolution that's healthy and where the right questions get asked. So before investing, investing is like dating, yeah. I want to make sure we have a bad date you know, and see whether we recover. The other thing about people, which I've learned too, is the person who introduces you to the investor is really important too. So if you Why? have, because it's, it's coming with their vote of confidence, their recommendation. I'm sure there are people when one of your portfolio company CEOs that's really successful introduces you to someone, you're going to take that pitch in a really Every different time. way yeah. than if someone random sends you the email. Totally. And I think that's really important to figure out when you find the right person, do research, figure out what type of companies the person invests in, and then figure out who should be the right person to introduce you to that investor. 
My best marketing is the entrepreneurs we've backed, including the ones who've failed. Uh, one of the th that's a great point. One of the things that I really was impressed, uh, Greylock used to do this when you were going down the path and negotiating. They say, happy to have you talk to some of our other CEOs. And they say, in fact, we will put you in touch with CEOs where the company, it didn't work out. And I encourage every entrepreneur, go talk to some of the CEOs where maybe the company didn't work out and understand what that investor was like during that period of time because you're, you'll really learn how they handle adversity, how they treated you, and just what were their priorities better than what you find out through their successes. So after over 15 years in the industry, I would recommend to people today, I'd rather not raise money than take money from assholes. It is <laughs> so painful, your life is too short, it takes the fun out of it, it takes your sense of mission and purpose out of it. And you know, when people say bad boards destroy companies every time, it is absolutely true. Mm -hmm. And I think that it, it, will, it will damage you as a human being to be in business with assholes, because you cannot fire your investors. You can't fire me. I can fire you, right. but you can't fire me. <laughs> and people don't realize how long these relationships are going to be, right? The average American marriage, I believe, lasts about seven years, <laughs> but these relationships with VCs are going to go on a lot longer than seven years, right? So, and you will be seeing these people every day. You well, should yeah. consider yeah. it your family. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. There's the, uh, the famous eight-hour road test, which is, you know, do you get along with that person well enough that if you had to drive from Boston to Chicago, whatever, you know, you still have stuff to talk about by the time you get there. <laughs> okay. And not so, the U.S. election. So how far in a pitch at an early stage, how far into the underlying tech should you go? Like, do VCs want to know about the code base and how proprietary it is and whether they have a unique solution, or do they just want to know what it does and what problem it solves? Hey, I think it depends. I care a lot about product, and so I'll always go demo, understand your design ethos, and very design-centric, so are you over-investing in design or do you take it for granted? Most people think design is easy because they don't get it. And then I'll want to know what your stack is because whatever evolutionary curve of the stack you're on is a very good indication of whether you're coming from the, from the future or the past. And you know, when we have to hyperscale companies like Deliveroo, you know, we're now in 60 cities with massive volume. You know, if you don't have the tech infrastructure to support that and you're sort of thinking dynamically about how you're going to deal with that, you're probably going to fail. So I think anybody who underestimates tech just does not understand tech. Sarah, did you see, at Greylock, did you see like great ideas with weak tech? With weak tech? Uh, occasionally you would see that, but for the most part, you, you had the opportunity to sit down and say, if tech was core to this, let's do a deep dive and understand it better. And sometimes that was done by one of the partners, and other times it was done by a close friend of the firm that would take a look at it. But it depends on the company and depends on the stage. Okay. We are out of time, but thank you very, <coughs> excuse me, thank you very much. This was absolutely fascinating. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you. Thank website. you, guys. Thanks, guys. Have a great conference.